the dawn of time, we've bonded into tribes. They guaranteed our survival in times of fear and uncertainty. Tribes use initiations to bond their group together. A tribe's warriors do battle to defend the borders. Elders pass on the stories of the tribe to younger members. After 125 years, the tribe that is the North Hobart Football Club has endured and prospered. For lovers of Australian football in Hobart and Tasmania, the North Hobart Football Club is an icon of the game, an example of what can be achieved using grit and determination, passion and enthusiasm, and a never-say-die attitude that permeates the lives of those associated with and touched by this great club. If the players who wore red and blue for the first time in 1881 were with us now, they would be astounded at what has been achieved. It's a family type thing and been uh sort of in your, in your blood all your life. I never played golf or anything like that. I just sort of got interested in the football side of it. And you just wait from one Saturday to the other to get back again. Yeah, because I love North Hobart. I've, I've been involved with North Hobart all my life nearly. I come from a fairly blue collar worker background, you know, and I've always felt that this is what North Hobart is. It's a blue collar worker club. And uh, from the day I walked into the gate, I always felt very, very comfortable about it. Once I connected with the club, and it was just like it was in the veins, and you know, it, it never leaves you. Hobart in 1881 was a tough and grubby little town. Its emergence from humble working class origin set its course for years to come. Around the harbour, there was the stink of industry tanneries, abattoirs, breweries, whaling. Well north of town, the Toffs lived along the Newtown rivulet away from the waterfront slums of Wapping. In between were the terraced cottages of working men and their families who lived in the area they called the brick fields. They worked hard and they played hard when they could, especially a roughhouse brand of football. Uh, well this is the heartland of the club well, since 1922 and it's bordered by Newtown which was uh, the, the rich end of town where all the farmers came across from Stainforth Cove and established their mansions up there in Newtown. There's the main road over there and it stretched up over Cleary's Gates. There's a huge quarry there, it still is. And that's where a lot of the people worked. On this side we had our Gile Street and then of course there's the cemetery down there now occupied by Campbell Street. So that, those sort of parameters sort of established the heartland of the club. And of course this is the, the hallowed turf where people played for, for well over a century. But before that, there's a little bit of a mystery really. We have lots of records of people playing in the most strange places. Little grounds here and there, whether it was a paddock or a dairy or a piece of grassland. And people sort of uh, took the, the Gaelic game and modified it for local purposes. By today's standards, football of that era could only be described as primitive. There were only 12 rules. The field until 1888 was rectangular. Teams comprised 20 players, although 16 a side was quite common, and goalposts had the rugby crossbar and captains settled disputes. North Hobart is, was, and always will be a working man's club. The hardships suffered by its members and stirring responses to hard times, including three major wars and several depressions, have created the legend of tough men and tough times. And it was really a, a bit of you know, Rafferty's situation. Rough and tough, poor surfaces, put the sheep in there, you know, let the sheep mow the lawns and, and just play for as long as you could. There weren't even rules about the time, the duration. So I guess they played till they exhausted or the pub was about to sort of open up. So, and pub life was important. Most of these places were conceived, most of these football teams were conceived in pub situations, certainly with North Hobart. The drinking holes of Hobart were the melting pots where teams were formed. Tired and thirsty workers gathered to discuss what they might do on the weekends. For the players of the North Hobart Football Club, the wagon and horses was the favourite watering hole. It's a place where many premiership campaigns were hatched. 
Well, I can remember many times going back there after board meetings. Back in the 80s, when we used to, when I was on the board, 70s, late 70s, early 80s, and I was on the board uh, going back there after board meetings and a few beers, in, particularly. Well, it's a sort of funny thing. I used to go to the, uh, I just remember the uh, Sunday morning um, uh, Sunday schools, uh, and it was just really great to be able to go and have a beer with those guys. They're guys that I'd sort of idolised. Then I played football with them, but not only did I do that, but I also socialised with them. John Devine is one of North Hobart's favourite sons. For him, the Wagon and Horses was a place to relax, a place of business, a place to plan, and a place to raise a family. This is where the loyalty factor comes into it around the place, because, as you know, I went down the road and opened, got into a hotel and been in business in Hobart for 40 years, and... The success of my first hotel I owe to the North Hobart Football Club because they just supported me to the hill. You know, all the so uh, I, that was a foundation for me as far as the business world was concerned and I, and I owe it pretty much the success of that to the people that, that come to the North Hobart footy on the Saturday afternoon and then come to my hotel of a Saturday night. So uh, for them forever I'll be grateful to those sort of people. Mark Devine went on to play a significant role with the club in premierships and was one of many of the North Hobart tribe that followed in their family's footsteps. Well, my earliest memories probably is because we lived at the Wagon and Horses Hotel, which was just a couple of blocks down the road. Being a typical inner city hotel, the, the backyard was a concrete uh, square about two metres in dimension. So. North Hobart footy ground was my backyard, um, as it was with some of the other kids in the neighbourhood. Um, I remember spending time here with Desi Graham's kids and Nogger Reed's kids, and yeah, we spent a lot of time just hanging around the footy ground, kicking footies around, and giving everyone that you know we were pests, probably is the truth of it. Um, but it was a great, great environment, you know, to be in, and, and it was my backyard. Being a product of the district meant showing a fierce territoriality. Players lived and worked and played side by side, building a community spirit which showed in the passion of supporters. Look, footy was a big part of the community and um, it was big and it was, a, it was a great great thing to be part of. You know, Playing for North Hobart really was an honour and we, we've got great supporters and they're still about and so many good volunteers. and. And they really looked up to the players, so, and we respected, obviously, our supporters as well. So it was a great education for me as a young kid coming down here and learning all those valuable traits to make sure that you treat people properly and things like that. North Hobart, for me, was um, a great education. Well, them days, it was... Everyone seemed to be friends. Uh, North Hobart, and you'd have your ribbons and... Even though you didn't know people's names, <coughs> they were friends. You know, it, it, it was a great atmosphere, really good. Oh, shops, no matter where you go, there'll always be a bit of red and blue in them. You don't see much of it about now, but back, back 15 or 20 years ago, people used to have a bit of competition to see. You'd, you'd probably go to the butch and take, take your meat home and find a red and blue ribbon around it. I think it basically it's been a blue collar worker club and there's nothing like the strength of working class people around you to make you feel strong and nearly unbeatable and I think that's the sort of formula that's been around for many many years and I think and that's still around around the club so it's a bit like the old Collingwood tradition you know you're either with them or we're against them you know and the people that are with them will stand and fight with for you you know uh, and that's why they've always been a, 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 a probably a, a foe that people have been fearful of. You'd walk down the street, and house after house, there were families in there, the colleges, family was there, and, and there were the Bennets, the Bessels, and, uh, and the Eatons, and uh, across the road uh, was where the Moore family lived. Across the road, of course, uh, lived uh, Darrell Eaton and his family. And it was a funny thing that uh, uh, they decided, that Darrell Eaton decided to move from Letitia Street into Smith Street. And the house was vacated. 
and the Moors decided to move in. Now, Cos's father was a sort of state old bloke and he didn't want to move. So he went to the local pub and came home and fell asleep in the chair. And of course they, they moved the furniture down the street and they moved Dad and all. And when he woke, woke up to go to bed he couldn't find where he was in the bedroom because they, they shifted him and all the furniture and everything. They thought it was a good opportunity to move while he wouldn't, wasn't there to resist. And so that's the sort of indicates the sort of tight communities where people lived, everyone knew each other and, and, uh, and shared their common interests and one of course was the North Hobart Football Club. The legacy of these early struggles was unparalleled success as the leading Tasmanian football club. 28 senior premierships, more VFL and AFL stars than any other. This is a colourful history imbued by the spirit of great players and names such as the two Jays, Devine and Leadham, Dasher Eaton, Nogger Reed, Lennon, Jack Dunn, Don McLeod, Jack Metherill, Darren Perry, the four Graham boys and 1500 other great names on the roll call of this club. The true meaning of mateship is present in all of their stories. And from this concentration of narrow streets and back alleyways emerged the great red leg teams of yesteryear, forming bonds that we today can only look back on with nostalgic wonder. Most of the footballers that played in, back in those days grew up in North Hobart. They were, and you had to be, they had, uh, you had your boundaries. If you're outside the boundary, you either played with Hobart or Sandy Bay or Glenorchy. You had to be in the district, living in the district in those days, which virtually meant you was a a product of the district, but in the uh, district football just sort of gradually uh, went out, they changed a few rules and that sort of thing and, uh, and it's what it is today, I think you can just about go anywhere you like today. Uh, yes, naturally enough, you know, um, most, most football teams, uh, brothers like to play with brothers etc, but it carried to extraordinary lengths in North Hobart, it was uh, grandfathers, fa fathers, Sons and brothers and you know, names like Colleges and Moores and Eatons and Bennetts and all these people, uh, it's just their whole family is committed to it. And now when you go to a registration day as I did yesterday, and people with the same sort of names are signing up there. And I think, well, what's going on here? And of course it's the chemistry, it's a sort of part of belonging and identity. And uh, that's what history is all about. People feel they belong to a great club, and it certainly is a great club. Well, I think yeah, North Hobart has always been regarded by a lot of, you know, particularly members and supporters, that you know, being a family-oriented club, you know, supporting the community, or the, particularly the local community. Um, I suppose back in the earlier days, uh, there, there wasn't a lot for people to do on the weekends, and I suppose the football club was a focus for the local community. And so it served the purpose of providing entertainment for the, the local people and also a, sort, a place for people to come and you know, play sport if they were good enough. Uh, I married uh, Nogga Reed's younger sister. Being a football family, that's uh, initiated into it and that was it. You go to the football or else. <laughs> Today's club general manager is Russell Manning, the grandson of Ed Russell, who started his career in the late 1890s and was the backbone of the team until 1919. Well, my grandfather was played with North Hobart, captain of the case in the early 1900s. And uh, on my mother's side that was, and I suppose I followed my mother, went to the football in the early days. Well, I can hardly remember it in the early days. But uh, I, I can remember my grandfather because he lived with us for a while and I can also remember staying with my grandfather and grandmother in Thomas Street which is up the road. Well, you know, records were pretty flimsy in those days and, uh, and uh, we've just got the, the barest sort of minimum so I've, I've a suspicion he might have played with North Hobart as early as 12 years of age. Um, that would make it really unique. But officially on record, we got him playing for, what, 15 years? With North, yes, from 15 From 1901 years, right through, there's records of him appearing in a photo in 1920. Yeah, and no, I suppose it's good that people talk to you about your grandfather and apparently he was, 
you know, quite a good player and played for Tasmania as well and uh, coached North Harbour, captained them to premierships. The 20th century had begun with hope as the colonies joined together in federation. Success on the field for the young club came in 1902 with North Hobart's first premiership, the first of many to come in the years ahead. Some of the people to help administer the club in this early period were men such as William Leach, George Miller, Sir Henry Jones and Charlie Dunn. A debutante in the 1911 season who epitomised the Red League spirit was Jack Dunn, who carved his name in the history books playing in five premiership teams, best and fairest, captain and coach and state representative. He held the club games record for nearly 40 years until Nogger Reed passed it in 1956. Jack Dunn was one of the greatest centre halfbacks of his time, a glorious high mark and a strong kick. His brother Charlie was already one of North's star players when Jack followed him to North and played his first senior game in 1910, aged 15. It was the beginning of a career that would span 20 years of football in Tasmania. He was still in his teens when he gained selection to play for Tasmania at the 1914 Sydney Carnival. Also that year he was part of the famous 1914 North Hobart TFL and State Premiership sides. Jack Dunn is pictured fourth from the right in the second row. His brother Charlie, who was captain, is pictured holding the ball in the middle of the front row. William Leach is pictured on the left of the second row. After the First World War, Jack rejoined North in 1919 and was appointed captain in 1920, a position he held from 1920 to 23 and then again from 25 to 26 and 28 to 29. In 1923, North Hobart again won the TFL Premiership, playing Newtown in the Grand Final before a crowd of 6,000 at North Hobart Oval. In this photo are North Hobart players and supporters in 1923. Jack Dunn is pictured fourth from left in the front row. In 1920, he was appointed captain of the TFL team, and while he was in that position, no TFL team under him suffered defeat. In 1927, he transferred to Devonport. Returning south the following season, Jack Dunn rejoined North Hobart, coaching them until the end of the 1929 season. He took them to the TFL Premiership in 1928, the first since 1923. Jack Dunn is pictured at the head of the line here. Alan Rate is also in the team, fifth from the head of the line. And Jack played in many representative teams that visited the mainland. He was a member of the famous Tasmanian team that defeated South Australia in 1923 in Adelaide, at Adelaide Oval. Jack Dunn was named one of two vice-captains in North Hobart's Team of the Century after playing 187 games for the club. He won the Best and Fairest Award in 1920 and 21, won five TFL Premierships and four State Premierships and represented the TFL and Tasmania six times. Football in the south of Tasmania was particularly strong in the 1920s. Other clubs had star players like Horry Gorringe and Jack Gardner. Dan Minogue, Alan Leach and Snowy Atkinson. But North's players were men like Les Stevens, Albie Bonnicher, Frank and Jack Dunn and Hector Brooks. The success enjoyed by the club ensured that the tribe has stayed strong for many years. The 20s and 30s were halcyon years for the North Hobart Football Club with nine TANFL premierships between 1920 and 1939 and five state premierships. After a distinguished military career in World War I, including a military medal and All-Australian selection, Hector Brooks joined up with North Hobart at the start of the 1920 season. In eight years with North, he played well over 100 games and was presented with North Hobart's most consistent player award seven years in succession. The key to North Hobart's success throughout the 20s was the Ruck Rover combination of Hector Brooks and Jack Dunn. Hector Brooks featured in a funny episode on Grand Final Day in 1923 when North Hobart took on Newtown. He was employed as a PMG linesman and was directed to repair a telephone line at Longley at 11am. 
He cycled to Longleat, effected the repair and arrived back at North Hobart in time to play midway through the third quarter and kick two goals. Some claim his boss was a Newtown supporter. North emerged victorious and later took on North Launceston for the state premiership, defeating the Northerners by 17 points in front of a crowd of 8,000. Alan Wright is recognised as one of the greatest full forwards ever produced in Tasmania, scoring 847 goals during his career which spanned 11 years. Wright gave outstanding service to North Hobart and the many combined state and TFL sides in which he was picked. But for a knee injury at the start of the 1934 season, he may well have kicked over a thousand goals in his career. He won the league leading goal kicker award five years running from 1928 to 1932 and then went on to win it a further three consecutive times in 1935, 1936 and 1937. He crossed to Victoria in 1933 after being lured to Footscray and played two seasons there. He offered his services to his old club North Hobart for the 1935 season, in the process turning down offers from both Footscray and Essendon to return to Melbourne. Alan Wright was always a big attraction in league football, and the memories of his many thrilling tussles with the best fullbacks of the day rank as some of the most outstanding incidents associated with the game in Hobart during the Between Wars period. Well, he was a big name. He'd just come back from Footscray, was it? Footscray. Yeah, Footscray, yes. And um, he was appointed coach of North Hobart. I think they'd won the Premiership the year before, hadn't they? Yes. Yeah, and he was appointed coach. They didn't have a very successful year, uh, but he was a... Uh, he was a lackadaisical, laid-back sort of bloke, you know, yeah. <laughs> I don't think the training meant a lot to him, but he, he was quite quite brilliant, you know. He was in, what, a, in what ways? So well, he was a great, a a great ball-getter, yeah. yes. Yeah, you know, he, he was where the ball was, and uh, I don't think he was a... He wasn't a spectacular high mark or a prodigious kick or anything, but he was... Well, very much like Peter Hudson, you know, a, a ball getter and user. Hmm. Jack Metherill's appointment as coach of North Hobart was one of the most inspired decisions made by the club. Metherill was the catalyst for the most successful period in the club's history. He came from a family steeped in football tradition. His father and five uncles were all top footballers. He played for Geelong starting in 1932 and was leading goal kicker three times. Metherall remained with Geelong until 1937, his last game a grand final where he kicked four goals in the Premiership team. Jack Metherall was a chunky half-forward flanker, forward pocket rover. He was a dangerous goal sneak, scouted packs cleverly for crumbs, fed to position smartly and kicked accurately. Metherall's appointment as North Hobart coach in 1938 did not meet with Geelong's approval. Despite repeated overtures, including the legal efforts instigated by the then Premier of Tasmania and North Hobart supporter Albert Ogilvie QC, he had to stand out for the entire 1938 season. North were able to withstand this setback and take out the Premiership. This was the beginning of an unbroken run of five TFL Premierships, four with Metherall as captain coach and four state titles under his coaching. Metherall left North Hobart to coach Cooey in 1946, returning to North Hobart in 1947 and captain coached the club to another premiership. Jack Metherall's record as a coach was outstanding. His own ability as a player was a big factor in the team's success. As a coach he trained his team hard and on training nights his booming voice could be heard several streets from the ground. He was awarded life membership of the club in 1958 for his outstanding contributions. Of course, uh, when the coach turned up, the first most vivid memories of the coach was Jack Metherill. And uh, I can remember Jack taking bets. He used to turn up in a horse and cart with Noggerreen. And uh, on the point post there, he'd take bets of how many goals he could kick while holding the point post. And people stand there and trade bets. And, and Jack was an expert, of course. Brilliant, brilliant kick in the forward pocket. And so he won a lot of money for those who didn't know him. Peace and the troops came home. Through the years that followed, the children of the baby boom generation were born.
life in Australia was good. The lucky country rode on the sheep's back after the lean wartime years. A revolution in music began with the new sound of rock and roll. In Tasmania, district football began. North Hobart Football Club won the first district premiership in 1945 and was successful again in 1947. Darrell Dasher Eaton was one of Tasmania's greatest ever wingmen. He was regarded as a great football tactician and became a highly successful coach. When I went coaching North Hobart, I'd already played with a lot of the players, like uh, Des Graham, Trevor Best, and uh, Noel Clark, and uh, Johnny Noble, and Ian Plunkett. I'd already played with them the previous year or two. And then to come up and get, be appointed coach, and I had to, uh, uh, you know, hold a pretty strong hand to keep them together, and uh, it, it, it worked. They, they used to abuse me under, under the breath, of course. <laughs> At, uh, no, we didn't do that, did you? No, I didn't think you would be. I, I didn't think it would you in. But uh, that was it. I, I, I didn't have any problems of coming as a, a play uh, mate to, to the coach and coaching. Uh, it, was, it was quite enjoyable because, you know, we, we had some good sides and winning premierships. You, you're pretty popular then. Darrell Eaton was inducted into the North Hobart Football Club Hall of Fame in 2004. Darrell Eaton died in January 2007 and was farewelled by a large crowd of family and friends, clubmates and associates. Today the Darrell Eaton Junior Foundation continues his legacy. Legendary Centerman, Rover, Back Pocket. All words used to describe Noel Nogger Reed. Fast off the mark and elusive, Nogger Reed was a multiple Tasmanian and TFL representative and premiership player for North in the late 40s. He was the first post-war footballer to reach 200 games, eventually playing 213 games for the Redlegs. Nogger Reed is one of only six North Hobart William Leach medalists for league best and fairest. I don't reflect much um, uh, uh, you know, on my footy career, but uh, I do take a lot of pride out of the fact that you know, I was the first Wyndham Leach medalist after Nogger Reed. And uh, when I was uh, starting at North Harbour back in 67, I, I, you know, um, Nogger knew my dad, and I was talking to Nogger about his Wyndham Leach medal uh, training one night, and he said, oh, he said, I've got it at home in a drawer. And I said, I'd love to see it, Nogger. He said, oh, yeah, come down home. So he took me to his place. We went in and he got it out of this little uh, wardrobe and a drawer in the wardrobe and there was his medal and it had a bit of an impact on me. Noel Reed was inducted into the North Hobart Football Club Hall of Fame in 2004 and is a member of the Demons Team of the Century as well as a North Hobart Life member. The mighty John Leadham, or Great JL as he's referred to, played his first game for the Redlegs in 1954. He was to become a legend of the club an inspiring captain coach and a match-winning player. Leadham possessed uncanny skills. He has been rated the best Tasmanian never to play VFL-AFL. Leadham is regarded also as a great leader and administrator. John Leadham was inducted into the North Hobart Football Club Hall of Fame in 2004. Well, I saw John Leadham play as a, as a young man, actually. I was a contemporary of his. I actually played a couple of games with him only because everyone else was injured or sick. But he used to mesmerise me and he did his opponents as well. He could play in any position and be successful. Incredible marking ability, beautiful kick and uh, his composure under pressure was just enormous. And he played the psychological game for the opposition, you know, talking to them all the time and he had small steps, could move in a very tight circle uh, and he was able to control his adrenaline rush and he was by far the most outstanding natural talent I've ever seen in a football. He was quite outstanding. And he had shocking feet. When we were in the rooms and he took his boots off, I wondered how in the hell he got out on the ground. He's the most grotesque feet. You ought to ask him to show you sometime. I suppose the greatest footballer was John Leadham, I reckon. Well, I liked his game because he, he, he would say to the, if he was on a play, he'd say to him, uh, well, yeah, well, shake hands and that was it. He would, 
and the players were on him. He probably had three or four players or six players on him during the game. He was that bloody good. Yeah, I probably didn't see a lot of John because I was only a kid, and as I mentioned earlier, in the country, so I uh, only saw him a little bit, but he made an impression when I saw him. He didn't look much like a football. He didn't seem to be quick, but he would just lope along the ground. And he just had, must have had magnificent ball skills and judgment and so on. Uh, he did have a bit of a reputation of being a bit, bit uh, rough at times. No, I don't know. I, I was, I looked after the young players. If anybody touched their young players, I'd, I'd see that they got reprimanded about it. But apart from that, I was okay. I, I've never, I don't think, you know, I got reported a couple of times, but don't let's go into that. <laughs> Probably one of the greatest characters that ever played for North Hobart would be JL. Terrific, terrific guy, bloody good footballer. Uh, but all, the, the thing I admired about him most was if you said anything to him from the sidelines or whatever, um, he'd just look at you with a bit of a grin, a bit of a silly grin. Didn't matter what you'd said or what comment was made, he just gave that cheeky grin and, and, that, and that was it. Went on with his game. All the time, captain and coach. Uh, when I came here north, had only under McCanker the year I came here, they'd won one or two games the year before. So we've got an influx of young players like Quinn and Cosmore and all those players, and uh, they kicked on. And we were uh, we won a premiership. We ran we were runners up, and we were out of the, in the four all the time, all the time I was here. So I think sticking to the young players, they were good young players, gave me uh, a lot of satisfaction. You know. Pretty well recognised, I think, that uh, John Leadham was one of the best footballers that had never, ever played VFL football. I went to Melbourne when I was 18 and I had a written guarantee of 12 games in the centre with Melbourne, but I injured a leg and they wouldn't do the operation till the end of the year and I got a bit homesick I was, and I came home, I suppose. Uh, I feel I, I'm happy now that I did come home because I've had a lot of success here and uh, I've been happy. The world changed through the 1960s. These were years of great social change, the rise of youth culture, Australia at war in Vietnam, and a revolution in popular music. At North Hobart, the 60s were years of successful achievement on the field. As the Robins, the boys won premierships in 1961, 62, 67 and 69. Barrackers in the Ride Street stand bellowed out the club song to celebrate. One of Tasmania's greatest ever wingmen, Des Graham played 229 games for the club, cementing his place in the tribe's folklore. He played from the late 50s through to the start of the 70s, vice-captaining the team for four consecutive years. Des Graham was a highly skilled and tenacious player and five-time best and fairest winner. He was considered courageous, gallant and an inspirational team man. I think it was about the second quarter. Oh, John Devine had him then, that's right. Uh, I think Darryl Baldock clipped, uh, clipped uh, John Devine and put him down. Desi Graham came in as the best uppercut I ever saw. Just laid big iron man Smithy, laid him right out, an umpire come flying over and Desi turned around and said, I'd better give him air, mate, I think he's fainted. <laughs> Unfortunately, someone's head was a bit, a bit stronger than my, my, my arm, but, but that's how things work out. They didn't need me anyway. John mentioned about Desi Graham being a tough fella and all that sort of bloke. And uh, I remember most nights you get a new re recruit into the club and the first thing Devine would do was say, uh, test him out Desi, and if he didn't come up to square one, he's gone, out through the gate. He was part of the 1957, 62, 67 and 69 Premiership sides. He represented Tasmania and the TFL 12 times. Des Graham is a North Hobart Football Club life member, a member of the Team of the Century, and a member of the North Hobart Football Club Hall of Fame. John Devine was a tough, no-nonsense player. He took the club through one of its most successful eras. He's acknowledged as an inspirational leader and a highly successful coach. The team didn't win a game during the 1967 season until Devine started playing in the seventh round. They didn't lose one again that season. I didn't really know what to expect, I'll have to admit, you know, it was in uncharted waters for me, but 
I knew the club had a lot of tradition and had a lot of success over the years, you know, when people like John Leadham and Dasher Eaton and all these fellas had played around the club. So I knew that it was a very, structurally, it was a very solid club. John Devine came to the, the club um, as a reputation as a tough, no-nonsense Geelong back man. And he was suspended over there for eight weeks, which was a long period then. So it, it must have been a pretty tough sort of background he came from. And our team was down on its uppers, really. We, we had a very lean season. He came to us in 67. And for eight weeks he had to serve out that, that sentence and uh, not even go on the ground. And, uh, but he changed the culture of the club dramatically. I've never seen one football have such a dramatic impact on a group of footballers. He was able to instill in a bunch of young players, they were all young, inexperienced blokes, willing to have a go, a lot of natural talent. But they, they called him Father. And that, and he's still known as Father Divine. And he sort of, they treated him like that. They would do anything for him. And so I remember that the fateful game up on the, the TCA when John Devine first coached the side. And he was sitting on the, the side uh, of the ground and then, of course, he was right on the white line. And yelling at the players at the top of his voice, he became so involved as if he was playing, he was ducking and weaving and shouting and yelling. And you could hear his voice all over the TCA. Well, those players just transformed themselves. And when he actually became a player and a captain, he just inspired them all. He kicked the goals and, and, and just lifted the whole team and with incredible acts of courage and uh, the culture of the time. He even went on to change. He thought the Red Red Robins were a little bit insipid. <laughs> so, so he talked the, the committee into changing the Robins to the Demons, which befitted his character. Um, <laughs> he, he was a father figure to us. I mean, he was an established player. Uh, you know, he was a recognised player. But he gave us a lot of confidence because we felt that um, if anything happened to us out in the ground, John was always there, you know, to protect us. So, in a lot of ways, I was only saying before, I felt he had a, an impact on us not only in a football sense but in a personal sense. Our character, he moulded a lot of our character, which has gone on through life. Yes, uh, very popular, and uh, a time of back, you'd, you'd never see him get on the bench, be rubbed down in front of the players or anything like that, because if he got on the bench, they'd get on the bench. He just, sometimes you take your side and bring you inside and get a little bit around, put on and do something like that. But I, and he, he did win one premiership, I think, as a non-playing mm -hmm. case, but I think his main inspiration, inspiration was when he was on the ground and leading by example, because he was certainly a very fine footballer. It was always said that he could have played VFL football as it was in those days for several more years. He was involved in premierships in 1967, 69 and 74 and doubled up with state premierships in 1969 and 1974. He captained and coached Tasmanian state sides and represented the state and the TFL six times. John Devine was inducted into the North Hobart Football Club Hall of Fame in 2004 and is the captain of the North Hobart Team of the Century. 1967 was a memorable year. After winning the TFL Premiership, North Hobart's team travelled to the northwest for the fiery clash against NWFU champions Wynyard. Newsreel footage captured the drama. Well, it's a famous goalpost day. Um, we got on the train here. I, I, that's how long ago it was. We had the train service, got on the train, the train broke down at Western Junction. We ended up at the hotel at Burnie, at getting there at 6 o'clock at night. I think we left about 9.30. It, take, it took us all day to get to Burnie. I, I must have been very gullible as a coach because I thought I tucked them all into bed about 10 o'clock ready to play, but apparently years later I heard that half of them were out on the town. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and they played a bit like it too on the Saturday. On, but uh, anyway, we got to the game and... Uh, and that was a fairly tough game against Wynyard. They'd had a very successful season under John Coglin, and they gave no quarter and asked for no quarter. They were uh, terrific. Uh, our blokes, some of our fellows didn't play that well, and then I found out why the reason. But anyway, we fell, got to the stage where, uh, you know, we, we net desperate. Dickie Collins took that famous mark, and uh, a fellow called John Pilgrim was the umpire at the time, and... Uh, 
they knocked the ball out of Dickie's hand. It was a 15 metre penalty in those days, and they brought him back on the line. But of course, the rest is history, really, because by the time he'd got back to have a kick at the people had jumped over the fence and and of course the goalposts were only sitting the ground in sockets they were easy lifted up and I said to Dickie at the time we've just better wait till umpires clear all this before you have a shot for goal make sure everything's okay and while I was talking to Dickie I seen the goalpost run up the middle of the ground three or four kids had the goalposts were boring down the other end of the ground with the goalpost so yeah, it became was I suppose at the time you didn't think it was all that funny but it's been a uh, great talking point, you know, and as now it's become Tasmanian folklore as far as football is concerned here. I don't remember a lot about that day, it wasn't a very pleasant day to play, I remember it was, it was a wind blowing across the ground, it was dull, overcast, uh, it was a real struggle all day, but, but of course to see, uh, to see all of the people rush onto the field as the siren went after Dickie had taken the mark and then the, the mounted police coming onto the ground and the pandemonium that broke loose and the, uh, I remember someone say, seeing this guy shaking the goalposts and then he worked out that they were in slots in the ground and they just pulled it up and down they came. And how someone wasn't hurt with that I don't know. And um, then we had great celebrations that night, so we got over our, our woes and uh, and then they got the goalpost on the train. And I was about to ask, yeah, did they do that? They got, oh yes, the goalpost was on the, I don't know who did it. Uh, I'm, not guilty, but uh, some of them got it on, somehow they got it uh, onto the train because it was one of those trains that uh, you came in a side door at the front and then you had a long corridor and then the police came on and they couldn't work out how you would ever get the goalposts through, down and at a right angle through this door and of course it had come in through the window at an angle, yeah. <laughs> so that was quite, where the goalposts are there I don't know. The 70s continued North's dominance on the ground and as a major part of the Hobart community. Dave Noonan and Don McLeod reflect on their time with the club. It's hard to believe, like I was 17, 18, I played my first year of footy and we were a very young side. And to come in and to have success, which we didn't expect to have, against a very hardened Sandy Bay side, it was fantastic. And yeah, the football was so different then. I mean, it was very passionate, the fans were passionate, the crowds were enormous and just the feeling that you could represent that club was just absolutely incredible. The club's always been a very strong club, um, very loyal to their players and to, the, to their supporters. Um, it's had good social uh, activities and it's had a lot of very hard workers who do a lot of work for very little in the way of reward. Don McLeod was a fine player, capable of holding down every position. He was a prodigious kick. Don McLeod is the club's current games record holder, having played 265 games from his debut in 1972 as a 16 year old to his last game in 1986. Oh, yes, I was pleased. I played 270 games, so I was happy with that. I always thought that I'd probably been shortchanged a bit because. Uh, the TFL wasn't terribly strong at, at uh, halfway through my career and the season was shortened on a couple of times to about 15 or 14 or 15 games, which probably cost me quite a few games. He's the only forward that I know of that could run out of the goal square, grab the ball, kick it back over his head and kick a goal from 30, 40 metres here. Over his head. He could run from the goal square straight towards the centre, centre circle, grab the ball, kick it back over his head and kick a goal. And not once, he could probably do it two or three times in a game. He was an instrumental part of the 1974 TFL and state premierships under John Devine. He's a five-time club best and fairest winner and captained the side six times. Don McLeod was inducted into the North Hobart Football Club Hall of Fame in 2004 and is a valuable part of the team of the century. In the 80s, statewide football took hold and the game changed again. Darren Perry remembers arriving from the north of the state wet behind the ears. 
The players certainly made me feel very welcome. Um, there was a group like Terry Moore and John McMurray, younger guys that had been around for a couple of years, um, that certainly made me feel welcome. And you could tell that the club was on the crest of doing something big. And I'll never forget our first game that year against Glenorchy. We actually won, and that was a that was a huge um, thing. Uh, it was a huge thrill for me because I didn't know anything about Glenorchy, anything about the competition, and. Uh, to play in that game and meet a lot of the supporters after the game, it was just a huge buzz for me. So I knew that I came to a strong, strong, powerful club that was on the verge of doing something really good. Darren Perry was a courageous, polished and talented rover and leader. The possessor of a magnificent left foot kick, he played in four premiership sides in the late 80s and early 90s. Darren Perry attained numerous honours during his career, among them the Darrell Baldock Medal in 1992, and the League Best and Fairest Award, the William Leach Medal in 1993. Darren Perry was inducted into the North Hobart Football Club Hall of Fame in 2004. He's a player life member of the club, having played 188 games for the Demons, and is a member of the Team of the Century. Oh, look, I, you know, it's fantastic. It was, a, it was a huge part of my life, and, uh, you know, I was, I was very lucky to succeed, but I also worked probably harder than the normal player. Like, when I came down here and I was struggling a bit, I thought, well, I could go either way, and that's to just struggle through my career or have a real crack at it. And, and I did that. I trained probably harder than any other player at the club, and because of that, I think that I got the rewards later on in my career. And um, you know, I was just fortunate enough that I was given the opportunity to play at North Hobart and um, enjoy a lot of spores that came my way. To match the status of the new league, the club appointed another Geelong backman. Gary Davidson. It was no coincidence that Geelong and John Devine connection was well established, and earlier of course from Geelong was Jack Metherill, another legendary North Hobart figure. Davidson was just as tough and ruthless as the great JD, but in a different way. He was not a playing coach. He relied on being a very smart tactician and player recruiter and manager for success. He had done his homework before coming to North, and checked out the exciting young talent just emerging in the North Hobart ranks. They were traditional North names, and their club loyalty and commitment could be relied upon. Family names re-emerged, such as Moore, College, Noble, Klein, McQueen, Morby, and John Devine's son Mark, and they could all play. It was in the genes. North, from the beginning, has always prided itself on being a family club. Davidson used all his powers of persuasion to influence the club's board to invest in four or five new players to complete a potentially winning team. North became the glamour team of the new league and took out the first statewide premiership in 1987, narrowly missing the next year and then won the 1989 state premiership with style. Arguably, it was the best side North Hobart had ever fielded. It was fantastic. I think Glenorchy, I lost the toss and uh, Glenorchy got the jump on us early. I think David Pearce kicked a couple of goals. Kicks. It is swinging back around the pack fly. Grace. He slips. He's up. He's grabbed. He's lost it. Gives it over to Pearce and Pearce goal. But, um, uh, at quarter time we were certainly behind. Might have been behind three or four goals and uh, we just really needed to regroup, which we did. And I recall... Um, Steve McQueen, I think, and Bradley Plain just did a couple of special things for us in the second quarter just to get the momentum going our way. His hands had spilt. McQueen has it though. McQueen snaps. He's put it through. Towards David Noble. Noble fires away down into towards goal. Webster trying to drop back on it. It's still in play. It'll be a goal to you with not believe. Unbelievable. Bradley Plain. Well, I'm lost for words. And uh, once we sort of turned the corner, really, um, we sort of kicked away and it was a pretty comfortable win in the end. Full forward Peter Hardman played his best game for the club in the grand final, kicking seven goals. In addition, Steve McQueen, who kicked five goals in the grand final, was drafted by Geelong, but chose to stay at North Hobart. What followed after the game was euphoria for the Premiership-starved North Hobart supporters and torment for the Glenorchy fans. A jubilant Davidson said that this premiership was even more satisfying than the 1983 flag he won with Glenorchy. Davidson was an innovator. 
he introduced a weights program for players. Oh, the brick circuit. Well, Dave, we didn't have enough money to get weights, so every player had to bring a brick. And um, after training for about 20 minutes, we'd um, work out with bricks. You don't think Darren Perry's arms got as big as they did without bricks, do you? We'd just have housing bricks, Pezza would have better blocks. He goaded club members with a literary bent to produce an annual club yearbook. It remains after 20 years as a centrepiece of the club's culture. He even recruited eventual Premier Jim Bacon as the director of football and bench coach. He also urged the club to develop new social club premises. This transpired, but it was an added financial burden for the club. The 90s started on a high, but the club quickly came back to earth, finishing eighth. Another tough Geelong backman, Mark Yates, was recruited to take the reins. He had all the attributes of his predecessor, Davidson, plus the services of brilliant bench coach, Chris Fagan. The combination was highly effective. North went on to history-making back-to-back premierships in 1991 and 92. Then cracks started to appear in the statewide league. All clubs had overcommitted themselves financially, thinking the crowds would flock to the new competition. But after an initial burst of enthusiasm, the travelling and imbalance in the competition took their toll. Attendances and club revenues tumbled alarmingly. Clubs abandoned the competition. Everyone was relieved when the statewide league folded in 2000 and clubs returned to their regional competitions. During the 90s, several players emerged to steer the club through the dark days of the end of the statewide league. Matthew Brereton was one of the shining lights. Along with his brother Jeremy, Matthew Brereton played consistent, outstanding football. Matthew won the award for player with most potential in his first year in 1991. By the end of the decade, he'd won the club's best and fairest twice in 97 and 99, and then went on to win it again in 2002. Matthew Brereton played 198 games for the club and is a Team of the Century member. Robbie Devine, nicknamed The Wiz, has emerged as a cult figure at North. He's a medium-height, robust and aggressive forward in the Lee Matthews tradition. Since he started senior football in 1994, he's delighted North supporters and driven the opposition crazy. He has played over 250 games, and his goal-kicking exploits are now legendary. Robert Devine has been the club's leading goal-kicker on five occasions and topped the league in 2000, 2001 and 2008. He was the club's best and fairest in 2003 and runner-up again the following year. He's kicked over 550 goals for the club and he's not finished yet. The youngest coach to be appointed since Eddie Russell a century before, Brendan Bolton, was just 24 when he took over for the 2003 season. It had been 11 long years since the club's last premiership in 1992. The physical education teacher from Georgetown had excellent credentials, playing for North Launceston from 96 to 2001, for the Tassie Devils, and playing for Clarence in its 2002 Premiership win over North. In his first game against his old team Clarence in 2003, Brendan Bolton gathered an incredible 42 possessions and kicked four goals in a best on-field performance. That game provided the momentum for a successful season with North winning its 28th Premiership by a record-breaking margin of 111 points over Hobart. Oh, definitely 2003 was a fantastic year, uh, with, uh, with the end being the Premiership. Uh, Brendan Bolton coming on board uh, added a level of professionalism that we hadn't experienced since we dropped back to a regional competition. Uh, we made a lot of sacrifices in that year, we were quite a young side. Uh, even training during the mornings just to come finals time just to try and get the best out of us and to instil the confidence within the playing group. Uh, the, the culmination of the grand final win, that was fantastic against Hobart by a record margin. Uh, and just the, just the friendships and the, and the connections you make with that playing group and the support, support staff around the club, that's a, that's a memory that will always live on and remain with us forever. The start of the 2004 season signalled tragedy for the club. First came the death of the Premier Jim Bacon. He was a great North supporter, administrator and mentor. He embraced the club like family. Later in 2006, 
came the tragic death of Peter Wells. He was the self-effacing quiet servant of the club who worked behind the scenes for half a century. The final blow came in 2007 with the death of Darrell Dasher Eaton, Campbell Street schoolboy, Tasmanian player, captain and coach and team of the century wingman. The memory of these greats burns bright at the club. All three were benefactors of the club. All have been honoured with memorial awards. They will never be forgotten. Perhaps in the long run, the most important recent development has been the club's deliberate strategy to restore lost membership and create a stronger image of the club as a community organisation to attract a wider supporter base. To this end, a flurry of celebratory social activities were initiated since 2000. The club's coterie group, the Tridents, was important contributors. With great ceremony, the club's Hall of Fame was established. It's now an annual event. A highly successful team of the century was chosen and celebrated. Then, in 2006, at the largest dinner in the club's history, we celebrated the club's 125th anniversary. Who will forget, at age 93, Arch Flanagan, the club's oldest player, a 1936 Premiership team member, addressing that huge gathering? Currently, the club looks forward to a new dawn as the statewide league concept is resurrected. North will once again stride the Tasmanian football stage as a colossus of the game, an enduring but adaptable tribe of leaders, warriors and families, all bonding together as one under the flag of the mighty demons. But this story would not be complete without recognition of the people that support, help and comfort the front line. Administrators like Charlie Dunn, George Miller, Ian Parker, Chris Boys, David O'Mant, Warren Brewer, Paul Curtin and John Leadham. Committee members like Bernie Dillon, John Gibb and Bruce Felmingen. Support staff like Don Reed, David Patmore, Teddy Lidster, Max Streets, Eric and Greg Wigan, Tony Hill, Mitch Brown, Rex Grandquist, Max Elliott and Keith Bradshaw. And the hundreds, if not thousands of volunteers that turn up every week to help run the kiosks, man the gates, raise funds and do the tasks that help keep the club functioning. The list is long and will continue to grow as the club continues to thrive. And last but not least, the supporters who've turned up every week in their thousands over the long years. The true meaning of mateship is present in all of their stories. Today, we cherish and revere the memories of the players, coaches, administrators, volunteers and supporters who've shaped this great football club. And while we look back to the heroes of the past 127 years, we also look ahead to the future, nurturing the young players who will one day proudly pull on the red and blue and do battle for the North Hobart tribe in years to come. <laughs>